Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Land, Life, and Liberation, Part 3, Palestine. My name is Sally Frater, and I am the curator of the Decolonize This Place exhibition, When We Breathe, We Breathe Together, which is currently on at the Art Gallery of Guelph. I'm going to begin our time together today with a land acknowledgement. Today, Guelph is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island. As we gather together, we would like to acknowledge that the Art Gallery of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Attawandaran people, and more recently, these treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant to this land and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. We express our gratitude for sharing these lands for a mutual benefit. Although we are convening virtually and might individually be located in different places, it is useful for us all to remember that wherever we are in what we currently refer to as the Americas, we are on indigenous land and that we should move forward in a spirit of mindfulness and reciprocity. I would also like to take a minute to acknowledge the horrific murders of the spa workers in Atlanta, Georgia in the US, and to say that our hearts go out to the friends and families of the victims and the victims themselves. Um, Asian Americans Advancing Justice is offering free bystander intervention training online and Stop AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander Hate and Fight COVID Racism in Canada are organizations um, that you can reach out to for resources. Uh, before we begin, some housekeeping notes. Since we are in a Zoom webinar, everyone's microphones are turned off. You are welcome, this is for all of the viewing participants, to submit questions throughout the conversation using the chat function, and we will share them with all of the panelists following the close of the conversation. I'd also like to say a quick thank you to Dr. Shauna McCabe and Jenna Brownlow for their technical support for this series. Land, Life, and Liberation is a series of five conversations that have been unfolding as an accompaniment to the Decolonize This Place exhibition, When We Breathe, We Breathe Together, which is currently on at the Art Gallery of Guelph until April 25th. The exhibition and, conservation and conversations center the Decolonial Operations Manual, which can be downloaded on the website of Decolonize This Place and the Art Gallery of Guelph as a starting point for reflection and action. The Decolonial Operations Manual embodies the principle of movement-generated media and is a document offered as a tool of study, reflection, and action. The manual is grounded in five years of collective thinking, art-making, and organizing undertaken by Decolonize This Place with dozens of groups in New York City, and beyond, with numerous references to movement work preceding the establishment of Decolonize This Place in 2016. The scale, material, quantity, and distribution form of the manual underscores the importance of freely shared printed matter in the work of movement building. The conversations will explore a number of threads related to the confluence of land, sovereignty, liberation, and resistance. Today's conversation, will feature Decolonize This Place members, and they will be joined by Chandy Desai, Erica Violet Lee, Mark Ayash, and Corey Balsam. So I'm gonna read everyone's bios and then I'll turn the conversation over to you all. Chandy Desai is, a, is assistant professor at the University of Toronto and a Palestinian solidarity activist who hosts the Liberation Pedagogy podcast. She has written articles on Palestinian resistance and revolutionary culture at comparative settler colony, or sorry, colonial e economies and resurgent solidarities. Erica Violet Lee is a Nahiao writer, scholar, and community organizer from Westside, Saskatoon. She tweets at at Erica Violet Lee. Mark Ayash is Associate Professor of Sociology at Mount Royal University and the author of Hermeneutics of Violence, 
He teaches and writes in the areas of social, political, and post-colonial theory, particularly focusing on the Palestinian-Israeli struggle. Corey Balsam is the National Coordinator of Independent Jewish Voices Canada and is among the lead organizers of IJV's No IHRA campaign launched in 2019. He has spent several years living and working in occupied Palestine. I'm very much looking forward to today's conversation as I have to all of the conversations. And I'm gonna turn it over to, um, to Abin to make some opening remarks. Nick, do you wanna go? Introduce. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I'm Natasha Dillon. I'm uh, part of Decolonize This Place. Um, I'm an artist, a filmmaker, an organizer. Um, and, you know, we, we, so apart from Mark, Chani, Corey, and uh, Erica, the other people that you see on the screen, we're all members of Decolonize This Place. And we all vary from between, you know, uh, writers to art historians to, you know, American studies scholars, uh, organizers, artists, human beings, uh, you know, just people who are like kind of family and, and kind of working together. Uh, we call ourselves affinity group uh, more than thinking of ourselves as like, you know, an organization or a coalition. Um, you know, our work is mostly more relational based than trying to think of activism or organizing in kind of a professional sense. Um, and, uh, you know, we started Decolonize This Place along six strands of struggle, which was, you know, Indigenous uh, sovereignty, Black liberation, Free Palestine, because the three of them kind of offer a triangulation which can upend empire. You know, many people have written about it, uh, but also like, you know, um, like today, you know, if, especially in the West and in, you know, Northern America, you have movements around decolonization and abolition. And within that, then Palestine becomes really important because of the kind of anti-imperialist perspectives and struggle that it brings in. So that also, um, you know, for organizing within our social movements, it does not become a kind of American centric or Canadian centric uh, conversation. And then uh, the other three strands of struggle that we had was degentrification, uh, global wage workers and dismantling patriarchy because we should always <laughs> be doing that. Um, I'll just say something very little personal around Palestine and then I mean maybe you can take over. I mean to me you know I started working um, around Palestinian solidarity when I met Amin in 2010. Uh, you know we met at ICP and we started doing mostly like you know uh, film projects and media projects which very much uh, then got rooted into social movement organizing and like movement looking at it from a more kind of movement generated art, movement generated uh, theory and kind of movement generated kind of like organizing from the grassroots level. And for me, I think for me, Palestine offered the lens of understanding settler colonization because my own context, I come from Punjab, um, you know, in India. So I have a much more like British colonialism kind of understanding of it. But once, you know, I went to Palestine for me it was like, oh wait, 1948 or oh, 47. Oh, I understand how they divided up the maps and like how they made up these borders. And, and then, you know, applying that also to uh, both United States and Canada and understanding settler colonization. So for me personally, Palestine was the kind of, lens which allowed me to also understand the kind of indigenous and black liberation struggle in the United States as as a as somebody who's been you know there for 10 years as a as somebody as an immigrant um, and then lastly I would say for me then also bringing it back home it has also been really important uh, looking at you know what's happening with Kashmir here but also most recently around the work uh, around not the, not the workers around the farmers who are uh, resisting you know on the borders in Delhi around land right and how land at this point is a central struggle um, everywhere and has been and you know and and you can talk about many places um, and so that I think I've learned I have a lot to a lot of love <laughs> to give uh, to Palestine and the Palestinian struggle for like making me see that and, and for me to also understand um, how land and then Palestine both are such important things to talk about, especially in the West, but also in India, right? When there's like so much Islamophobia and also the kind of development of Israel into this like, you know, um, weapons manufacturer kind of leader in, in, in surveillance technologies and, and the kind of like, uh, you know, landscape that is because I'm also a media studies uh, kind of a person. So anyways, that's just some you know, personal points on why I think Palestine is important for us, no matter where we are. And then one last thing, you know, um, just be poor says this often, like why Palestine, right? Because Palestine's everywhere. It's coming for us everywhere. And we can see that in terms of both technologies, you know, that are, that are, you know, like control technologies of control, but also in our organizing spaces. Um, yeah. I mean, do you want to take over? 
Thank you. Um, I think that you said it all. I'll just say a little bit about where I'm from. So I'm Palestinian from Elbira, but I've been living uh, in, you know, occupied uh, lands, Lenape lands uh, for the past 10 years. And for me, I've had to contend with as a Palestinian whose land is occupied to be on occupied land and what that means <clears throat> in terms of responsibilities and obligations and also in terms of analysis as a way to move in the world and live. So that's kind of, you know, my background. But I want to shout out all the members of the collective here. You see their names. And I'm going to pass it on to Eric. You know, and, and each of you will kind of share where you are and what you're doing and what matters to you. And then we'll just have that conversation. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Erica Violet Lee. I am on Neheo and Métis and Dene and Anishinaabeg territory right now in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, middle of Canada, or so-called Canada. And uh, I am a writer and community organizer based in, um, I guess my work is based on urban indigenous resurgence and life. Um, and lately, a lot of my focus on writing has been on Black and Indigenous solidarities, um, but obviously always in, in my mind as well as international Indigenous solidarity. And during my work with I Don't Know More and in my work with Indigenous Climate Action, um, I realized how universal a lot of our struggles are. And Natasha brought this up with land as a central struggle. Um, so whether it's like in an urban indigenous context in the land that's currently referred to as Canada or in Palestine, or um, I think often of the dispossession that is specific to black folks and black life, um, land is so, so central to us. And in an indigenous worldview, any indigenous worldview, um, and I think just as um, someone who is a being on this earth, that land is so crucial um, and important. So today I'm going to be drawing from um, a couple of texts that are really important to me over the last little while, um, thinking about Black life, uh, BLM and the struggle for uh, freedom, post-BLM and the struggle for freedom by Ronaldo Walcott and Adil Abdullahi. Um, and Recently, uh, Ronaldo Walcott also released On Property, which is another book that's really informed my understanding of land and property and nationalism, and Border and Rule by Harsha Walia that just came out as well. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm coming from. And maybe I should pass it on to someone, or do you have someone else in mind? To Chande. Hi, so uh, thank you so much uh, to all the organizers for, uh, you know, organizing us to be here and um, so thrilled to be in conversation with all these uh, wonderful people. And um, yeah, so I just want to also um, point that I'm on Haudenosaunee uh, here on Windat and uh, the lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit um, here in Toronto. And um, I want to just begin by the question of why Palestine for me, and then maybe uh, kind of think through land, life, and liberation uh, in a brief sort of way. But why Palestine for me is that I, I grew up in Southern Africa uh, during the heyday of the anti-apartheid movement. And at the age of seven, for me, Palestine uh, was something that was deeply in my consciousness. And actually the PLO had strong, the Palestinian Liberation Organization had strong relation to African, strong relations to the African liberation movements because of the, the way the trainings worked and the way third world internationalism works. So for somebody like me growing up in that part of the world, Palestine, we couldn't think about liberation in Southern Africa without the liberation of the Palestinian people. And so that is central to um, how I come to be, but I'm also, you know, by way of India in which um, India had a particular relationship to Palestine, which is deeply shifted over the years in a really aggressive kind of way. Uh, but India played a central role in also advocating for the Palestinian struggle in a central way. So the, the global geographies that inform my consciousness are deeply uh, from an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist perspective. 
and that has shaped why I come to Palestine. Now, um, I've been doing work in the Palestinian solidarity movement for a long time. I've, I also go to Palestine frequently. So, I mean, maybe next time we're in Elbide, um, near the, you know, Fanoon Center having coffee. Um, but I, uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about what's been on my mind in the past year because there's been so much happening around the geographies and the context that you're also thinking about. And um, so I'm, I'm going to speak to both the intellectual and political organizing I've been doing. Um, but what last January that came to the forefront was the de jure annexation plan um, uh, from inside, you know, where Netanyahu was talking about this. And though de facto annexation has been happening in Palestine, um, Netanyahu's plans were coupled with the Trump, you know, deal of the century, so-called Middle East peace plan. And while that was happening and we were organizing around no to the annexation, that de jure annexation, not the annexation that has already been going on for decades, um, simultaneously, uh, we had the mass uprisings take place in, uh, in, in, in this in the state, you know, so-called Canada, around the Wet'suwet'en resistance um, and um, defiance and refusal against the construction of the coastal gasoline pipeline, um, which was met with, you know, brutal militarized forms of uh, police violence um, as Indigenous people were trying to defend their lands. And so for me, I thought all of this came together, the de jure annexation, the Trump plan uh, and fascism, um, what was going on with white supremacy around you know, um, Jewish, uh, white supremacy against Jewish people in the U.S., which coincided with these mass uprisings in Canada. And um, that enabled some of us that have been doing Indigenous solidarity work for a really long time in this context, specifically from the context of the Palestinian struggle, to renew some of those relations and ties. Um, I, I was part of a lot of solidarity efforts here um, to stand on the front lines on the rail blockades, uh, participating in those blockades, uh, you know, raising money for material support for the blockades or for the land defense um, um, uh, uh, legal funds, right? Because people were incarcerated uh, because of their, the, them putting bodies on, their, on the front lines. Uh, also participating in various rallies and then also doing lots of educationals uh, for movement folks to politically really understand also the Wet'suwet'en context, the pipelines, and what that means. And, and so that work was both with Palestine solidarity organizations and organizing uh, and activists, but it was also with my students at the University of Toronto where I teach, uh, because many of my students are also Indigenous and Palestinian and Black and from many racialized communities in which we were also trying to uh, make ties to the community in ways that really reflect it. So an example was during that period, uh, one of the land defenders at Wet'suwet'en that was um, imprisoned, um, who was a former student from my program, we brought her and spent a lot of time thinking through what that means. And at that same time, the BNC had released, uh, the, the Boycott National Committee in Palestine had released a statement, which we shared with them and which we send to, you know, people like Sylvia McAdam that are part of, you know, that were found, founders of I Don't Know More, to sort of also both symbolically show the way solidarity was coming from Palestine, but also how we were at organizing here. And we were giving updates to folks in Palestine through the BNC coordinator around the work that we were doing here um, to also, because Canada gets removed or the work that's happening in this geography gets removed out of the Palestine solidarity conversations. The U.S. is centrally the focus. And, and we've been doing a lot of work to build with so many communities here that that was really, really important. And so what that, you know, another sort of moment of uh, Indigenous uh, building was during 2018, when myself, Linda Tawar, May Ella, um, and uh, Audrey Huntley um, from No More Silence in Toronto organized an Indigenous feminist delegation that traveled from Six Nations to Palestine, and they got to see the serious impacts of um, land, you know, we, we sort of organized as feminist land defenders that were looking at land defense in both geographies, and not just looking at the violence of settler colonialism, but also looking at how we imagine new possibilities um, and, and new ways of delinking from, you know, the settler state, because those models have been used by Indigenous communities here, and of course, during the First Intifada, those models were central in Palestine. So, we had a lot of deep conversations about that kind of work. And so when we were doing this organizing, a lot of students, a lot of activists, a lot of solidarity folks were asking, like, Chani, what's the history, you know, of Indigenous Palestine solidarity here? 
And there is a long history that is over 50 years old, but nobody really knows it. And so I've decided to write an article that'll be coming out uh, for in the Journal for Palestine Studies in their 50th anniversary special issue in, in three weeks on this deep history, uh, but also not just the internationalist history of, of, of the way we've built solidarity, but the way the struggle has also evolved. So the way you start with, you know, the American, um, the American Indian movement, the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Red Power activists here that make connections to then, you know, the connections that activists make to apartheid and, the, and using apartheid as that analogy and then moving into the contemporary around climate justice pipelines um, and other kinds of connections. So that has been central and part of it, part of what I've been thinking about along, along, line, along the lines of that is not just that yes, these struggles have analogies and there's so many parallels, but also they're very different. And I think that I needed to do a theoretical intervention in terms of how actually these, these settler geographies are not the same because they have different histories of state formation. They have different histories of imperialist uh, relations and capitalist relations. So I needed to sort of do that, but also situate that within a global history because we have to think about slavery. We have to think about labor migration and dentorship. And of course, um, this theft of indigenous lands through genocidal practices. So that being said, um, that I think also motivated me, motivated me to really think about why is it that we need to think about solidarity? Because oftentimes what happens is in these, in these you know, solidarity moments, there's a lot of symbolic solidarity that happens, but sometimes the tensions of how to build becomes a huge issue, right? So because different people might be asking for different things. And sometimes there are contradictions, sometimes there's actually a lack of understanding, or sometimes there's academic language that actually then gets taken in by activists, but activists don't know um, what that really means historically. And then that becomes a really big tr uh, troubling way of how we actually build. So the settler binary, indigenous settler binary is a huge issue. And Eric, I really love the fact that you put up that book, those three books, but also the, the last one, Border Rule, because I think migration has been completely erased out of how settler colonialism here is thought about specifically forced migration. So part of this intervention that I'm trying to make is so we can really think about world making together in terms of thinking about black liberation, Palestinian liberation, indigenous sovereignty, abolition, um, and, 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 and migrant justice and labor struggles and working class struggles and feminist struggles in a way that is comprehensive that nobody gets excluded out of thinking about liberation. Because when we think about getting free, sometimes in this moment, nationalism takes over and a nationalism then precludes how other people that aren't, that don't belong to this territory or aren't national to this territory get evicted. So that's that. And then the last thing I just want to say is that, um, you know, the Liberation Pedagogy podcast is a space where I've been having these conversations all year with folks around Black, Black liberation, Indigenous liberation, um, Palestinian liberation, other, other perspectives. And it really also brings me to um, uh, Natasha's sort of intervention or um, thinking around farmers in India and Kashmir and these really important struggles globally where I have often thought about internationalism as a framework for um, solidarity and oftentimes solidarity, I know in the context that I'm in becomes about identity politics. And I always say this, that while identity can be useful in certain ways to kind of you know, make sense of how white supremacy or capitalism or imperialism, you know, operates or divides people, what it doesn't help us do is actually see how structures and systems are connected. So internationalism for me, both historically and the present is so important because when we look at what is going on with, you know, the rise of the far right, whether it's in Brazil with Bolsonaro, whether it's Netanyahu, whether it's Modi in India, whether it's you know, all of these regimes are connected and they're sharing technologies of violence, they're sharing military equipment, they're sharing technologies, and all of these are being tried and tested on Palestinians at the end of the day. And, and it's an infrastructure that lots of money is being made out of. So I just want to say that all of this is important, I think, to both solidarity, to land defense, but most of all to liberation. And um, yeah, and so my, my, my life has been very, very uh, committed to these issues, including uh, most recently the fight against the IHRA, which I'm sure we're going to get into uh, in a bit. Thank you. Mark, if you're, if you're good to go. Sure, thank you very much. Um, 
I'm, I'm speaking to you today from the uh, homelands of the Nitsitapi, the uh, Nakoda, and the Sutina Nations, and uh, Métis Nation as well, region number three in Alberta. Um, like uh, Amin, uh, I was uh, also born in Palestine. I was born and raised in Silwan, El Quds, in Jerusalem. Um, I, I lived there for the first 14 years of my life under Israeli occupation before immigrating to what is now called Canada. Um, and like Amin, uh, the most difficult aspect uh, of my move uh, to this place has always been um, how do I now understand my positionality here as, as part of the settlers and not part of the indigenous uh, peoples. Um, and I finally had the guts to now write this out. So hopefully it'll appear in a co-edited uh, book as an introductory to it um, uh, at some point um, in the near future. Uh, but, but that is certainly one of the most difficult aspects of, of, of coming here. And, um, and, and certainly in, 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 in creating relationships and meeting people with, with indigenous peoples in Canada, that has helped me deal with those. Uh, pe people like Erica, uh, people, uh, people that I've met, Cowboy Smith uh, X in, in, in Calgary, uh, the, 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 the formidable Madonna Thunderhawk. Um, um, and, and people like that have, have had a, a really profound uh, uh, impact on me and my ways, ways of thinking and, and how I've come to, uh, to, to deal with that difficulty uh, and uh, continue to deal with that difficulty. Um, and and uh, thank you as well. <laughs> I forgot. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Thank you, Amin, uh, Sally, uh, uh, Natasha, Andrew, and, and Decolonize This Place for, for organizing this. This is wonderful. Um, I, 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 I was able to listen to one of your previous events and it was great. And, and one of the strange things about attending all these uh, Zoom meetings is um, I forgot that I was a participant in this one <laughs> until I got called. Um, uh, so um, maybe I'll, I'll, I won't mention too much about, uh, um, uh, you know, specifics of my work, but, but let me just kind of maybe just give you a piece of that substantive piece. And I'm, I'm, more, I'm much more of a theorist uh, 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 than anything else. Um, and and uh, uh, it, it's, it's wonderful for me to follow uh, Chani's uh, uh, terrific uh, uh, presentations and comments because it saves me the trouble from, from describing the, the negative effects of over, overlooking the differences across these struggles and how that can, can conceal indigenous voices and, and, and the specificities that, that we find in, in, in all of these different struggles. Um, and, and in my humble view, uh, I think that when we talk about solidarity, I often find people think that we need to come up with a huge list of things we have in common that we agree on. I don't think that that's the case. I actually think it could be just one or two things uh, and they could be really abstract. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Commonalities and solidarities across history and all sor sorts of social movements uh, have never needed, uh, you know, a 200 page academic book to tell them what their commonalities are. In fact, that's the antithesis <laughs> of what makes a movement works, uh, work, um, though that work can be, of course, useful in activism. So uh, in, in my, in my uh, sort of uh, just uh, entry level uh, conversation sort of starting uh, effort here, let me pose, I think, two things uh, uh, that we can, we can focus on as points of solidarity, as points of commonality across these differences. Um, and, and let me start with the, with the structures that are uh, uh, oppressing us in these struggles. Um, th th this, in specific, you know, I'll take, I'll take the sort of, uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the focus a little bit more on, on indigenous struggles um, fr from Palestine to Standing Rock, as the poster says, at, to idle no more, if I may add, as well. Um, the structural violence that oppresses indigenous peoples from Palestine to Standing Rock to idle no more is called settler colonialism. And th this thing that is called settler colonialism isn't some natural concept, some, some a uh, natural object that exists out there in the world that has a definition that is everlasting and non-changing. There isn't a, an original case of it that, that everything else has to fit into in order for it to be called settler colonialism. That's not what it is. It is a structure of violence that is ever-changing 
within all sorts of within you know even if we take just canadian settler colonialism how it operates today is not the way it operated 200 years ago so it is a constantly changing structure of violence and and it changes within contexts and across them as well but one of the features that it does share across history and across these geographical spaces i think is the fact that it rests on the dehumanization elimination and um, dispossession of indigenous peoples. Um, and, and let me focus on that element of, of dehumanization to start with. Um, it, it is often the case that, in, that, that indigenous experiences, indigenous philosophies, indigenous perspectives, indi indigenous paradigms that, are, that are, have been built up and used and, and, and developed by indigenous peoples to explain that structural violence. All of that is often bracketed, uh, bracketed uh, within, a, within a region that, that is devalued and silenced within the settler colony, within imperial centers. Um, it is often painted as emotional reactions, as based on feelings, just to give you kind of a couple of recent, uh, or sorry, uh, simple manifestations of that kind of discourse. Um, it even can appear in, in, in especially liberal discourses, it can appear as, as a valid uh, accounting of, of experiences of violence that we ought to, uh, you know, oppose and, and not support. But it almost never is allowed to enter the level of a paradigm as that which explains the structural reasons for an experience of violence. And, 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 and that's, it, that, that's, that's actually a feature that runs across colonialism. M.A. Césaire discussed this, you know, uh, 80 years ago now, I think, or 70 years ago. Um, so so th that's that part of, of, of dismissing, of, of, of silencing, of, of marginalizing indigenous paradigms and philosophies for explaining st the structural violence that we call settler colonialism, that is a critical element of the dehumanization of indigenous people. And it doesn't just happen in the extreme discourses of a Trump or a Netanyahu, it happens in the liberal, in the centrist, and in NDP, uh, if, we're, if we're saying in Canada, in NDP spaces, in the, in the so-called democratic progressive left. Um, uh, so, so we need to really, uh, um, you, you know, to me that's always a point that I have always found it a point of solidarity. I can relate with Madonna, with Eric, Madonna Thunderhawk, with Erica Violet Lee, almost immediately on that level. We, we, can, we can almost, you know, we can almost, uh, uh, without saying a word, already see how we've both experienced that and continue to experience that. Um, so so I'll, I'll just say that for, for, for the, the, the level on, uh, in, in terms of describing the sort of that commonality on this, the, the level of what it is that it is oppressing us and, 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 and eliminating us and, and marginalizing us. Uh, in terms of resistance, I do think there's also, we can, we can start to point to one similar ground upon which we can build while still recognizing those differences uh, and supporting each other in those differences. And that is the simple quote of land as life, to, to take from the, the title here, land life liberation. Um, for indigenous struggles, land attains a significance and a meaning that is far more deep and superior to uh, uh, the, 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 the notion of land as, as an object to be owned and uh, uh, sold and demarcated and bounded and, and all of those sorts of things that the capitalist modern nation state has, has, has brought into our world, the Euro-American modern nation state. Um, and, and encountering that, you, you find a much more meaningful relationship to the land and, and to life um, uh, that, that understands the depth of that connection in a variety of ways where you can't, you can no longer separate them. Um, so so if, if I may just uh, tie this into something more specific uh, uh, to show you what I'm after, I, I, again, talking to indigenous activists, I always, uh, 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 and, and, and black activists like Ronaldo, two excellent books, uh, Erica. Um, the, the, it's, it's the, you know, we all share 
a kind of disdain <laughs> a little bit for that discourse of neoliberal human rights. That, that again, I don't want to spend time here criticizing the idiots. Uh, uh, let's let's focus on on the more on, on the more powerful um, um, uh, structures that that keep us down. Um, and 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 so you know that that discourse of human rights that oh yes I want to help the Palestinian people uh, you know get an education get a good job get good health care that's that's a limited that's a highly limited approach that that human rights neoliberal human rights approach speaks nothing to to what Palestinian liberation actually is to what indigenous liberation actually is and its deep connection to the land there's there's an insistence on the belonging and our existence on these lands that that you know our existence and the lands are not separate you can't separate them that's the liberation that we're after not some uh, 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 neoliberal human rights uh, uh, discourse that in the end does nothing to address those structural problems uh, those, those structural uh, uh, violences that, that continuously oppress us. And if I may just end on this, I, I never discount the power of inspiration in these struggles and in these solidarities. Um, you know, everybody engaged in these kinds of struggles knows that despair is the number one thing that you have to fight against uh, because we're up against it. The odds are against us in all of these struggles. Um, and, and sometimes that despair is hard to, to handle and, and you don't tell me you don't think of giving up even if you just do that to yourself. Of course, most of us never <laughs> say that out loud. I wouldn't. Well, I'm doing it right now, I suppose. Um, but, uh, but, but there is that, there is that uh, uh, sense of inspiration. Whenever one of the struggles is having a down moment and, and the Palestinian one is having a very low moment right now, possibly the lowest in its history, um, it's inspirational to look at Black Lives Matter and say, okay, it's possible. <laughs> Even if it's, and I know that they're all saying it didn't work what happened last summer. And I know, and I agree, but there's still inspiration to draw from that. There's still inspiration to draw from, from I don't know more. And vice versa. I hear it all the time as well. It's like people telling me, oh, we draw inspiration from you. You're so brave. And I'm like, really? <laughs> what have we, <laughs> what has worked for us? But, um, but it's, it's, it, you know, that kind of inspiration and, 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 um, you know, that, that mutual support is, is, I think, really a critical point as well. So I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, Corey. Wow. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for everything that's been said. And thanks um, to the organizers of this event. Um, I feel to some extent out of my league, uh, sort of intellectually. It's been a while since I've been part of such a, an intellectual conversation. I, I did actually did my master's with with Chutney and, and Ronald Walcott was one of my props and you know so but it's been a little while uh, since I've been part of, of, of such conversations but but you know again uh, thanks for the invite and happy to participate um, so I'm in uh, Montreal uh, Jojaga um, it's a uh, Ganigahaga territory here on the island of Montreal um, I'm a settler of course um, I uh, my family came uh, to some extent as refugees, um, escaping pogroms in Eastern Europe, and one of my grandparents uh, is a survivor of the, of the Nazi Holocaust, and was you know, basically the only survivor in his family, um, but and nonetheless, uh, you know, a settler uh, regardless, and of course, as Amin said, you know, that comes with, with certain responsibilities, uh, so I feel, you know, primarily, I have many responsibilities, but I have uh, dual responsibilities, not dual loyalties, I'm not loyal to, <laughs> to any state really, uh, dual responsibilities both to Turtle Island as a settler here and uh, to Palestine given, um, you know, the unavoidable connection um, <laughs> that, that I have as a Jewish person, uh, you know, especially given the way in which um, the institutional Jewish community is, is mobilized around Israel and is weaponizing anti-Semitism. Um, you know, so, so that's really where my involvement uh, comes in terms of, of being involved uh, as a Jewish person in Palestine. Uh, and thinking about it, uh, you know, it, it, 
Judaism terms, there's a there's a concept called tikkun olam, which is sort of healing the world, which sounds a little cheesy in a way, but you know we we sort of interpret it uh, and and read into that you know decolonization and and in solidarity and and doing this work uh, of you know this crucial work, um, for example, Palestine solidarity. Um, which leads me, you know, today is actually the beginning, tonight is the beginning of Passover. Um, so, you know, what a perfect, I don't know if this was in any way intentional, I don't think so, but, you know, it's a, these are perfect themes for Passover, right? Uh, life, land, and liberation. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways, it's a really interesting conversation, actually, in many ways, it's, a, it's an interesting holiday to talk about colonization and decolonization uh, and, and um, oppression and, and resistance, right? Um, you know, I mean, just life, uh, first of all, I mean, we could probably sum up the whole story in those three words, life, um, you know, past, God passed, passed over the houses of the, the Jewish uh, houses uh, when, when um, killing the firstborn Egyptians, right? That was the last plague, uh, liberation from slavery, and then land um, taking over the promised land, right? <laughs> Essentially colonizing Palestine, um, you know, upon God's wishes. Um, so, so it can be seen as a very colonial story. Um, but then there's also, and it depends on what you what you focus on, you know. And and uh, lefty Jews like us focus more on the liberatory side, of course. Um, and you know, there's a lot of work these days. Uh, you know, engaging with Passover in a way that is that is quite decolonial and that, that stresses very much the the uh, you know liberatory aspects. Uh, we have a, a sort of book that we read, and now there are like hundreds of these things, or thousands maybe. Uh, and of course, in, in my family, for a long time, we have a major focus on on Palestine solidarity, and uh, really sort of based on this idea of no one is free until everyone is free. Um, and you know, we we. We, we, we sometimes talk about the sort of colonial aspect of it, engage with it in that way. Um, but of course, it's, it's not stressed as much. Um, I also wanted to share that, you know, I was, I was living in Palestine for a few years. And, um, you know, I made a point with my friends to, to, to celebrate Jewish holidays, in part just because, you know, that's what I normally did. And also just to sort of show that it's possible. And, and you know, many Palestinians thought it was great because these things were always, you were never shared with them, right? They were always kept out and kept out by force. Um, and, you know, one thing that just hit me, I think the first Passover that I spent there was, you know, that uh, as with most Jewish holidays in Israel, uh, the occupied territories and Palestinian communities are sort of on lockdown. Um, and of course, you know, so you have all these Israeli families that are celebrating their liberation, you know, and talking about their liberation story. And in order to do that, they have to essentially lock up the indigenous population, right? Uh, that's quite striking and says a lot about, about the hypocrisy and, and, and the ironies of the situation there. Um, but of course, you know, don't call it apartheid um, or, or, or you're anti-Semitic. <laughs> um, and, you know, this is, of course, the crux of the problem with the IHRA definition and, and how it's been weaponized to shut down, um, you know, protest and, and, and criticism of Israel. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, just really briefly, uh, I think part of why I was invited for this conversation was because uh, IGB has been running Independent Jewish Voices, which is the organization I work for, has been running a campaign um, since 2019 uh, to challenge the IRA definition, uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which essentially uh, follows in the path of um, those who have argued that there's something called a new anti-Semitism, which is essentially anti-Zionism. Um, and, uh, you know, those who object to uh, Israel as a state that privileges Jews over uh, the indigenous population, essentially. Uh, and, you know, what we've seen is that being weaponized around the world in many ways, um, often targeting people of color, uh, often targeting Palestinians and, and Muslims. There are, you know, there's something called Canary Mission, which is, you know, which profiles mainly people of color who are working on Palestine. That's not exactly the IHRA definition, but it's within the same sort of tradition. 
<laughs> right? Um, and so, you know, we're trying to essentially dismantle that uh, while also trying to dismantle anti-Semitism uh, and, and point out where the real problems are. Um, it, you know, I think one, one thing we're seeing in the way in which this is being sold um, is really a sort of prioritization of, anti of, of fighting anti-Semitism over other forms of oppression um, and racism. Um, and I mean, it's it's really, you know, it's, I wish we got as much space in, in op-eds and media as, as, as some of the institutional Jewish community organizations have, but, you know, they're often quoting or, or citing statistics that show that Jews are like the most targeted uh, of, of everyone. Um, you know, something like 20% of hate crimes, repo police reported hate crimes are targeting Jews. But of course, um, those are only the ones that are, that are police reported. Uh, something like, I think it's like 2% target First Nations people in Canada, which is like completely <laughs> backwards. And, and, and you're right. I mean, um, I think, I don't want to get too deep into this, but the issue there is that, you know, there are there's research that shows that those who are more comfortable uh, with police uh, and and the structures that be are much more likely to report things like hate crimes, um, right? So it's not it's not necessarily that the Jews are most targeted, even though of course there have been tar you know there have been uh, targets uh, you know violence against Jews. Uh, but I think we we need to put this all in perspective uh, and make sure that that we're fighting all forms of racism and oppression intersectionally um, and not you know prior prioritizing this struggle uh, over others. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Andrew wants to say something and then back to you, Eric, uh, and we'll just keep another round of that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a comment that I think speaks to something that, uh, that everyone said in a way. Chandi, you mentioned um, a deputation um, that went to Palestine from, I think, No More Silence, Indigenous Feminists, uh, and that was a solidarity uh, journey. Uh, I, I've also read about um, journeys from First Nation leaders who, who are being solicited, <laughs> uh, let's say, by, by Israeli authorities as, as part of a Hasbara uh, type mission. And uh, to express quite the opposite, which is solidarity with uh, with the Zionist self-perception of indigeneity. Because let's not forget that uh, many Zionist Jews, and this is really central to early 20th century colonization, consider themselves indigenous and they're reclaiming an indigenous relationship to the land that's rooted in antiquity. And th th that's, one of, that's one of the, I guess, the the specific uh, factors that differentiates <laughs> settler colonialism in, in in historical Palestine from other places. Most colonists don't, you know, they don't assert a relationship of indigeneity to the land, uh, except through you know some sort of super Christian uh, lens of of you know being promised the land in, 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 in the rhetoric of the promised land that, that drove a lot of settlement in the Americas for sure. But, uh, uh, but this is a, a, a very real conviction on the part of a lot of Zionist Jews. So that complicates the matter, I think, when, when, when we're talking about indigeneity um, uh, internationally and across settler colonialism. And I'm, I'm just very interested to hear uh, your perspective uh, from from where you are, you know, across this border, because uh, I think it's a little different for those of us living in the U.S. and you know, Canada has this ex extraordinary uh, history, uh, which in many ways is um, the roots of apartheid. In many ways, I think are in or in Canadian history, you know, the Indian Act of 1867 and the past system and so on and so forth. You, you know all of this history, I think for a lot of folks joining today, we might not, but uh, these, are, these are in many ways the instruments of apartheid and Canada has a very particular role to play there in that history. That's just some general comments that I think link, link what I heard you all saying. Uh, Erica? 
Yeah, thank you for that. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think that to that point, it's sort of um, important to remember or like acknowledge. I was just on a panel yesterday on Black and Indigenous solidarity um, relating to some really awful anti-Blackness and anti-Black incidents that had happened at the University of Windsor um, that we know happens all across um, so-called Canada. And one of the things we talked about, which I think is equally as relevant here, is that um, Indigenous people, non-Black Indigenous people in the context of Canada are um, not permitted, but like encouraged to engage in this reconciliatory discourse um, where we're propped up by the Canadian state, but only if we are, are willing to um, act in a certain way that is respectable, that is based in asking for state recognition. And I've had lots of experience with this and seeing um, like First Nations leaders as they would refer to themselves, um, just completely selling out other indigenous people across the world. And I think this is a product of reconciliation and the way that we are taught to, that the only possible way to claim humanity, which in itself is a concept that was not created for us, um, the only way we're able to claim any sort of humanity is if it, we appeal to our relationship to our colonizer um, and to settlers. And that is, so, we're so limited by that discussion um, to, to never consider ourselves in relation to or prioritize our relationalities with Palestinians, with other indigenous people or with black people across the world. Um, there is one sort of uh, quote I wanted to share from Black Life um, here that I think about this quote basically every day and I think it sums up just so much of how uh, the Canadian state um, is a, a genocidal project, is something that ultimately needs to be abolished in order um, for freedom to exist. And I think that this will link in a lot to is the Israel Palestine um, discussion. So they say, we are bored with Canada, which is a great opening line. We are bored with the ongoing attempts to make Canada right. We are bored with scholarly and intellectual exercises meant to bring nuance to the violences that institute Canada as a formation. We are bored with the crime that Canada is and represents but yet we keep returning to a particular scene of the crime. The crime is the founding of the nation state we now call Canada. Um, the scene in question is that of how black people and blackness is revealed and simultaneously erased in the unfolding violent drama called contemporary Canada. Um, and in relation to this on in property, our, in On Property by Ronaldo Walcott, um, there's the discussion about how, and relating to Border and Rule by Harsha Walia. And there's the discussion of how <laughs> my cat just hit the computer, um, of how the nation state itself is a, is a way, and always has been a way to, um, to create property out of land and to make land something sellable, something ownable. Um, and so ultimately this is what I see and what sort of relating to what Mark was talking about, what I see as a, a key point of solidarity between um, indigenous movements in so-called Canada and Palestine. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to just kind of, in relation to what's been said so far, just say something, a, a connection between the, the definition of what I'm hearing, uh, the anti-Semitism that people are adopting, and in, in fact equating it, uh, thinking around Zionism. I think that in, in, the, in the occupation of Palestine or the colonization of Palestine, and I bring these things up more as technologies, ways of doing, that we see them operating even on a city level, on a police level, on a counterinsurgency level. 
It's not that it's just state practices in that way. But the thing about <clears throat> the understanding, the Palestinian understanding, and I'm saying this as just a Palestinian, what I, the strength of it was when it looked at what was happening to the land as a Zionist movement, not one related to religion, though there's a history of that and how that got kind of worked up into a reason to go, right? And a reason to, you know, all the kind of powers. But thinking about Zionism and land, since the 20s and 30s, it was critical to think of it actually as a class-based thing, as a proper, like the introduction of property. There was a whole discussion amongst Palestinian society that Hassan Kanafani had written about, many people have written about, the complexity of what Palestinian liberation was, wasn't contingent on a Palestinian state. That was something that tried to deal with a moment that was actually imposed from above. Now with the 67 and then, you know, the occupations that happened and the two state solution and the one state solution and the, all this nonsense, we're at a moment right now in which going after the using the term Zionism, which opens up a lot of possibility as an entry point back to the land and thinking about land versus thinking about nation state amongst people is where the Palestinians are right now. Now the technology of the Palestinian authority or Hamas and Gaza or these kind of things, they're very similar to like leaders that get set up by colonizers that don't fucking represent anyone but themselves and their children and their fucking money. And we see this happening time and time again with the not-for-profit industrial complex here, with leaders of tribes, with certain centers that represent speaking on behalf of entire people, though the colonial condition doesn't allow for it to happen. So I want to also kind of like think about the monolith of identity or even the construction of these identities as ways to get at something that honestly, like, we want to get free. That's not synonymous with fucking nation states. And I think that we're there on that. And I think it's important even, and I bring it up for two reasons. Part of why we're having this conversation or why we tried to do it around this time is because of Land Day. Land Day was in 1976, that was the first time. But that was the first time a day was announced by which Palestinian people all came together and said the land, right? Um, in ways that they haven't since the occupation uh, in 67. So I, I bring that up kind of into the conversation of thinking when we think about Palestine and Palestinians and what does it mean to get free, that there still is this idea of like, you know, anti-blackness that we need to think about, you know, uh, the, because we mimic the colonizer in our thinking as well. Right. So and then thinking about what does it mean for us to get free, but us to have different class positions in relation to that as we struggle. Um, sorry, Chanda. That is actually a perfect segue to sort of how I wanted to enter into the question that Andrew asked, because I think what people forget is there's no essentialized indigenous people. Right. Whether it's internal island or whether that's Palestine in that people might have an, an identity, a national identity as in Palestinian, but that I think that when we also think about class and I think class gets removed out of this, that when you introduce the class relation, it actually situates Palestinian, Palestinians differently. So Mahmoud Abbas is not what represents the Palestinian workers or the Palestinian peasants or the Palestinian refugees, right? Or the Palestinians in the diaspora. So I think that that, leads me to actually talking about um, the, uh, the question around the leadership, right, of um, uh, that Andrew raised around those that went, uh, or, or yeah, the, the, the AFN that was invited to go um, to Israel by Israeli leaders. And so what had happened, this was, I think, sometime in, two, in the 2000s, somewhere, like maybe 10 years ago, where essentially what had happened is I think this question around how does how do colonial powers start to, or settlers in other contexts start to now articulate an indigenous relationship to indigenous people here, right? Specifically, Zionists. And I think part of it is there is you know this idea of playing playing some kind of indigenous native that happens in 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 terms of the consciousness of settlers, but 
More importantly, part of it is they've also looked at the success of the BDS movement, right? The boycott, divestments, and sanctions movement. They've seen the way the BDS movement has been growing these relationships with Indigenous struggles, with Black struggles, with other anti-racist movements and struggles. And so part of it is it's almost a, the strategy where when the colonized renew and, and, and have their relations resurge, right? So these relationships that Palestinians have to indigenous people here or in the, in, in the context of the US or elsewhere, they're not new or, or to black movements or to Asian movements or whatnot, those are not new. But because of the way capitalism has structured it, especially neoliberal politics, solidarity also, you know, um, especially when Oslo was signed, things happen. And so because of that, what that has allowed for is that there is an amnesia around the relations that the Palestinians have had to so many other movements. And so what it, when BDS came to the, you know, like to the scene and all of these relations were re, you know, built, um, a lot of sort of the Zionist lobby wanted to use and rupture that by saying, you know what, we have to actually mess up these relationships. And when we look at the Wet'suwet'en struggle today, a lot of this discourse is used right around, oh, but there's division. If you hear in the Canadian media, they'll say, but no, they, they did, you know, some, the, what, the hereditary chiefs have one line and then the other people have another line. And, and there's this divisive politics around the fact that, well, a lot of Indigenous people want the pipelines, which is not true, actually. It is the people that are being paid by industry, people that are profiting from the, you know, destruction of Indigenous territories and land and life. And so, this reminds me then of the PA, right? In the same way in which the PA, the Palestinian Authority, can also become, um, you know, participants in settler colonialism. So they can be collaborators with the Israeli state to maintain the, their capital interests. And the PA has its own police force that is now policing its own indigenous people. This is also the case in South Africa, right? Black people police black people today. So I think that when we introduce class into our analytic, we actually, in capitalism, we start to see the question of indigeneity in a way that really ruptures an essentialized way. And I think that one of the terms that Kehelani Kone, um, that works in Hawaii, an indigenous um, scholar and activist, she really says to indigenous folks, you know, from across the hemisphere, that we cannot participate in red washing because that's exactly what this is. This is red washing when we participate, you know, in projects that further Zionism, when we participate in projects that are about the oppression of the Palestinian people um, through especially, you know, these like co-indigenous related things or like sharing histories on particular moments um, in which the oppressed and the oppressor become confused or the colonizer and the colonizer become confused. So I find that really, really helpful in terms of, you know, um, indigenous folks also having that critique. And I think Erica, you raised this really interesting point, right? That a lot of times because of the way reconciliation has taken place and people are forced to like engage in a particular dynamic, this relations to these relations to other people might not be in the imaginary as at the forefront. And I think, you know, when I first learned about the Gaswenta, like when I learned about um, the Tura Wampum, one of the things, which is a treaty, right? One of the things I remember asking indigenous elders was, so if it was with the settlers, the two rows was with the settlers and the indigenous folks. So those of us that arrive into this colony that are not on the row, what happens? And how can we build in treaty relations with indigenous people if we're not on that row? And can there be a different way that we mess with that, you know, or create a new, a new additional line or something. And so it was a kind of imaginative question and maybe people thought it was silly, but it was actually quite political because it was this idea that treaties were signed, right? Between, between um, uh, folks and, and I know that our arrival on these territories is possible because indigenous people have signed treaties that allow or, you know, welcome newcomers to be on these lands or, or folks that have been pushed away, but that doesn't absolve the responsibilities newcomers have to Indigenous sovereignty struggles or um, to Indigenous political uh, orders as well. I think, though, the state will use, right, this to divide and conquer. So a lot of times also newcomers will be like, but they are supporting the pipeline. So what do we do? And so, again, trying to mess with the disrupt, like disrupt these like narratives. 
I think is really important. I think the other piece, one of the things that I also trace in this article that I was talking about is the relationship between reconciliation and peace deals. So in the Canadian context, you have reconciliation, truth and reconciliation, and in, and in um, Palestine, you have Oslo and then this Trump bullshit. And why they come to the forefront is actually indigenous militancy, mass uprisings, and a disruption of capitalism. So when we actually take capitalism as a central focus, it shifts how we understand everything, right? In identity, nationalism, uh, resistance, and solidarity, and, and co-building. And finally, I just want to say two points because it's land day. One is the land without a people for people without a land was used by the Zionist project to particularly take land and make people believe it was empty in the way Terra Nellius here in North America is used to pretend indigenous people didn't appear. And the other piece I just wanted to say, because I mean, you, you brought up Ghassan Kanafani, who was my favorite writer, um, is, is, is in 1976, Mahmoud Darwish, Taufik Ziad, and Samael Qasim, the poets of Palestine, the national poets of Palestine, were part of Land Day and were part of, you know, they're in the Communist Party. And Taufik Ziad read this poem and I pulled it up really quickly because I wanted to, Erica read a piece and I thought it's important to also uh, bring it to that. They, he read this on Land Day in Lidda, in Ramle, in the Galilee, we shall remain like a wall upon your chest and in your throat, like a shard of glass, a cactus thorn, and in your eyes, a, sta a sandstorm. We shall remain a wall upon your chest, clean dishes in your restaurants, serve drinks in your bars, sweep the floors of your kitchens to snatch a bite for our children from your blue fangs. Here we shall stay, sing our songs, take to the angry streets, fill the prisons with dignity. In Lidda, in Ramle, in the Galilee, we shall remain. Guard the shade of the fig and the olive trees, ferment rebellion in our children as yeast in the dough. In Lidda, in Ramle, in the Galilee, we shall remain. Thank you. <clears throat> That's beautiful. Um, Mark? Sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, that that was beautiful, uh, um, and and I and I agree with with the points raised by both uh, uh, Erica and Chani. So so I won't I won't repeat any of that. But um, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, it, it's a good question, and it raises uh, important questions around indigeneity, which is a complex issue here. But I do take issue with the historiography underpinning your question, which I don't think actually captures the uh, the accurate is, is not the accurate description of of the situation. Um, uh, Zionism, of course, whenever you're talking about settler colonists, you know, if, if, you're, if you're thinking of doing like a, a poll to ask them why did you come here, that, that's not the point really of, of studying and critiquing uh, uh, settler colonialism. It's not, it's not the individual or family or even small community motivations that drove people to go somewhere. It's the political project in which their movement and actions become meaningful. And the direction that 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 action is taken into that's the significant point of analysis so the political project of settler colonialism must always remain at the forefront of our analysis when we're talking about these things not necessarily the intentions of specific individuals or, or their actions or, or families even um, or small communities uh, and and the political project of zionism pre uh, pre 48 and and not for, for a period even after 48 was unabashedly and unapologetically framing itself in settler colonial terms, not as an indigenous peoples returning. Some of that discourse was there, of course, anytime you're talking about a political project as complex as Zionism, you're going to find different strands all over the place doing, arguing all sorts of different things. But the main thrust, the, the dominant force of that political project was to set themselves up as uh, akin to European colonizers in the United States, in South Africa, they sent in Canada, in Australia, they sent people to those places to go study how they were uh, uh, dispossessing uh, uh, indigenous peoples and, and, and doing the same, uh, uh, enacting the same rules and laws uh, in Palestine. Um, they, 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 they would talk to uh, European leaders, especially in the early parts of the 20th century, as the vanguard of civilization in the land of the Orient. That was the dominant discourse. It wasn't, uh, um, um, uh, oh, th this is our indigenous land and we need to come back. It was only after uh, um, uh, decolonization, uh, only after uh, across uh, uh, Africa and the Middle East and other places around the world and in Asia, um, after it, 
colonialism and settler colonialism became a bad word, it's only then then you that you start to see Zionism shift gears and draw on different registers to justify uh, uh, the, the dispossession and the colonization, settler colonization of Palestine. Um, and, and one of those is precisely the one that you pointed out, which is that claim to indigeneity, which again is found in other settler colonies. I know you, you, you mentioned it briefly there, but uh, it's, not, it's not a side point of other settler colonies. Uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, we're really the indigenous people, we're really the ones that are going to, that, that this bland, land belongs to. And it happened not just on religious terms, Veracini writes about this, to critique this point that Zionism is somehow unique from other settler colonialism only because it was the only one that claimed uh, indigeneity at some point in its history. That's, it, it's, it's not true, others have as well. And again, that gets me to that point of comparison. When we're talking about comparison, it's not, it's not one, you know, uh, original model of settler colonialism that if you don't meet all those criteria, you don't belong in that paradigm. It doesn't work that way, right? So, so there are differences, of course, and, and Zionism does have differences in how it uh, mobilized that register of indigeneity, especially, and continues to do so now, which is becoming stronger and so, and I suspect will become even stronger in their discourse. Um, but, but we need to we need to be attentive when we're looking at that as well at the historical archive. Um, what are those arguments to indigeneity that Zionism makes, not Palestinian Jews who have been there for as long as any other Palestinian? <laughs> um, um, uh, the, the specifically Zionist historiography, how, you know, what are their claims based on? Um, um, you know, it's, it's quite shaky grounds uh, uh, that their arguments are based on. And, and it's grounds that erases uh, um, any other non-Jewish life on that land, <laughs> which has existed for centuries, of course. Um, and, and, and conversely, it's, 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 it's true that um, uh, indigeneity as a sort of a, a modern version of that term and, and politics has come become more central, especially on the grassroots level. You're not going to find it really in the PA or, or anything like that, but you're going you're to find it on the grassroots level much more. It's true that that has appeared as a kind of a, the post-Oslo, in response to the post-Oslo uh, uh, failures and, 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 and defeats uh, that was Oslo. Um, but, but Palestinians have had uh, different articulations of their indigenous connection and belonging on the land, to the land, of land as life, dating back to the early parts of the 20th century. One of my articles does argue that Palestinian Fallahin resistance in the early parts of the 20th century is actually the perfect illustration of land as life resistance. Um, um, and, and, and in it, you actually find much more commonalities between the land of, as life of, of those early Palestinian Fallahin than uh, uh, with, 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 with indigenous people than you'll ever find in the, in, in the Palestinian Authority or, 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 or parts of the PLO. And the PLO, we have to remember, is a mixed story. It, you know, it, it, there, and, and like Zionism, of course, it has different factions. There was the dominant part of it that eventually did become the PA which is as much, uh, well, let, me, let, me, let me use a different language, uh, which is quite harmful to Palestinian liberation. Um, and, and you will find, you know, some, just like you will find some of the harshest critiques of, of uh, indigenous politi political ideologies and groups and organizations that have betrayed indigenous peoples and, and betrayed indigenous liberation, you'll find the harshest critique among ind indigenous activists and scholars. Uh, not from some, they don't need from anybody from the outside to tell them about that. They, they know about it. Um, and, and similarly with the PA, you don't need to look past Palestinians for that critique on the grassroots level, activist level, scholarly level. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's really, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, Faiz Sayyid, you know, he wrote about Israeli settler colonialism in 1965. Um, um, Kwani, if, if I'm saying that right, I always struggle with her name. I hope I got that right. Uh, but but she, in, in, a, in, a, in an article from, or an essay from a few years ago, she says, if anything, I learned settler colonialism from Palestine <laughs> um, uh, for, to, to argue against people who say that, oh, Palestine is kind of just jumping on board now to, 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 to catch a moment that, 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 that is popular. Um, and, and, and again, and, and just as uh, Erica mentioned, uh, anti-black racism within indigenous communities, anti-Palestinianism within uh, uh, indigenous communities. There's also anti-blackness in Palestinian communities. There's also a, 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 a much needed 
education and lack of uh, needed because of a, a huge lack of understanding of, of indigenous issues um, uh, in Palestine. And, I, you know, it's, it's not a it's not a good enough of excuse to say, well, I don't know, um, you know, uh, and, and I, when I first came here, I was as surprised as any Palestinian today that still doesn't know that indigenous people exist because I actually didn't know. I still didn't, I didn't really know that I would run into indigenous people when I moved to Canada because the story that I'm told over there, um, um, you know, I went to a, a school that was established by the French Jesui. So uh, I learned much more about European history than I did anything else. <laughs> um, and the story that I was told there is that they're all gone. They don't exist anymore. Um, uh, and when I went back to Palestine in 2017, I met people who were surprised when I would tell them about indigenous people. They're like, really? They're still there? And, but, but I will tell you this, when they learned that they were still there and they said, oh, there's, there's hope for us. <laughs> if, if they survived, if they survived that onslaught, then maybe we can survive it too. Um, um, so that was kind of the reaction from there. But, but, but these are things that we need to address in our, in our uh, communities. Um, uh, and we do. And that's 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 the point that I also want to emphasize. We already do. Um, just most people aren't usually privy to these conversations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, just to also kind of throw another thing before I pass it on to Corey. I mean, I think, and and this is again coming from a movement perspective in terms of the things that we've been working on here, and also kind of drawing on Palestine. And I'm not. This is not an intellectual point at all. But I think that. One of the things in which solidarity is important as a strategic point is that it allows you to see things in a different temporality, right? So crossing over from one space to another on a trajectory, a linear trajectory of settler colonization allows you to understand how technologies and mechanisms are working. Simultaneously, the crossover, what it allows for is like different nodes of power through relations to emerge that deals with, as you just pointed out, Mark, but I'll just use it. What it does is like, it's an intervention in epistemology. <laughs> like it's a, it's a knowledge thing that opens up a space to then allow for other imaginaries to come in that have been foreclosed by virtue of a certain narrative that's told, right? And I think action can allow these other ways of thinking to emerge, especially if we connect. So it isn't solidarity. It's like, I wanna help you because you'll help me. It's not that transactional thing. It has to be something that's based on a strategic choice. And in that strategic choice is a recognition that our liberation is either collective or non-existent. Okay, how do we actually implement that, <laughs> right? And I think that becomes something. The other thing I wanna say is like, you know, look, I, I've, I've consistently said this. I think that Palestinian, I know, like as a Palestinian, I know that Israel and settler colonization is the problem. But the thing that hurts the most is how we, how we have struggled right now to resist more effectively, right? And I, I don't say that with any care, like with a lot of care. I think that for me, the PLO, like what people understand from the outside as the PLO's contribution, right, also kind of diminishes the intricacies that have been happening. One technology Israel has used consistently is killing people <laughs> that are more meaningful in the struggle, in the conversation, not in their singularly important, but in the conversation, right? And they have these maps of like, who do we get rid of? Who do you get rid of? So you end up with a person like Mahmoud Abbas and his children, right? Or, and you can go on and on. But the other thing that, you know, Arafat started that was terrible, right? Is the reliance on money to get liberation. Right, and where the money comes from. This is similar to the idea of NGOs. We have to, what do movements for liberation require and how do we attain them? And how can the modes of us organizing contribute to them versus some kind of quick way of like the Russians are helping me, this rich guy, who, who, do, who do we have? Uh, Nabilsi, uh, what's his name? The idiot that actually made Oslo channels happen. Nit, who is, what's his name? Um, um, Masri. Masri, I was just going to bring him up, Munib al-Masri. Munib al-Masri, there you go to Nablus, the only place that has a place that hire other than yeah. fucking house that looks like a I fucking mean, castle. But just to bring to your point, actually, Munib al-Masri is a good point, but because I think that the, you know, 
I just thinking of what everybody's saying, I think one of the biggest challenges is the kind of reorientation um, that we need within our own communities around this narrative of like, or development and progress, right? Which is the kind of settlers modernity project or the European modernity project that we see everywhere, like from villages to, you know, like anywhere in the world right now, you go development means a certain thing. You need a mall, you need a KFC or a McDonald's or like, you know, these are like you know, on a very basic level, right? Um, and so I feel like a lot of like, um, the struggle, I mean, I, I was thinking about it, especially when Erica brought up, like, you know, the people who support pipelines, right? Because that's the, that's, that's the kind of narrative that has been told to us that we can't imagine another way of, like, you know, progress or humanity or, you know, any of these things. And I think um, that's also something really important and which also then moves away from all of these human rights frameworks that, you know, we, we've been, you know, Mark brought up as well, like, you know, um, like whose humanity are we asking um, to be part of, right? And I think uh, that reorientation among our communities is so important. And I think that most of the times we struggle because counterinsurgency is so strong as, as you were mentioning, I mean, around anybody who tries to even imagine or enact or, or even try to do it in terms of action anywhere, not just in Palace. I mean, we've seen that in New York. I mean, I'm in New Delhi right now and you can't even say like anything about, you know, what's going on. Like, I mean, what's happening with the farmers here who are basically, you know, saying that we don't want to live this, you know, modernistic like development lifestyle. We don't want corporate agriculture. We want our one land, you know, one acre of land where we live, we have our house, we have our cows, we eat from there, like that's it, we don't need more. And that's what's also like this way of living or relationality to land or, or, or other beings or, you know, all of that is also majorly under threat, just, you know, including with our own people. Um, and I think that, that that's the kind of, yeah, I just wanted to bring that in. And, and to add to that, I think that just to finish my round up my point, I think that if you look at, for example, Right now you have elections, right? So you have Palestinians participating or not participating in Knesset elections in Israel. Okay, so that's the one state solution model. Then you have the two state solution model where you have people that look like you, right? Put their boot on your, on your neck and say, vote for me because I'm the only option. None of them make sense, right? But that's, that's, that's the model, but it came from somewhere. See, the, the choice that Arafat had to accept uh, was this idea of like to be born into modernity, to be born as a nation state, right? The coupling of nation and state must be a prerequisite, right? Nation and state borders, this kind of thing has to be a prerequisite for you to exist. And in the process, the laws that you needed, I know this because I worked on them, the laws that the Palestinians needed to adopt for, for nation state to even be a possibility around opening markets, around what kind of laws are there, around NGOs coming in from the outside and labor laws not applying to them, right? And them getting paid more than the Palestinians there and not learn anything through an exchange of knowledge sharing even, right? So that when you look at like the isolation of Palestinians and Palestinian thinking, that it was even on the NGO level, because where did the NGOs come from? Germany, Netherlands, all these nonsense places that provide this modernist, Western modernist, like modernity concept in which it encloses upon itself a conversation of what is possible. So then you have Palestinians just running around, just like, well, here, I'm being civil. Here I'm behaving because it's it's about this respectability thing. And right? they always bring in youth and gender issues. There's ten uh, okay. NGOs so on women, youth and gender women issues. Women is an issue. Yeah. Women yeah. is an issue. Youth is an issue. You, this is an issue, right? So I think that now I want to say this by by bringing up one point that was mentioned recently is how low things are and how how deeply kind of hurt people feel in Palestine to say that, and we were joking around this, the conversation right now is what constitutes a manifestation or a mobilization or a protest. And the argument that's being made is three is enough. And that one of the people could be a you know, citizen journalist and the other person could be the one that called for the thing and one person showed up. But that is equally important to what's happening right now. Just like, you know, Basil al-Araj, you know, the fact that he was, he was able to resist and, 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 and chose, chose that path is equally important to these moments. So they're small, but they're really important. 
and they have both in them. And I think that to, to bring this back to the, you know, to bring this back to these leaders, but also these parties or these factions, they're alienating of people. They're alienating of most people, but they occupy the space, whether it's the PFLP, that, you know, whether it's, you know, Hamas or whatever. The people on top are a class formation that's separate than the people that are on the bottom but yet they speak for them. And in the name of like not going against each other because we will die, unity is the only thing that's keeping us, is this discourse that I think has been, it needs to change. Now, how does outside solidarity relate to this? This is important. Like I'm a Palestinian, but I'm over here. I have a Palestinian passport. I, I don't have a Palestinian passport though my sisters have. So then these people that are speaking about liberation or return or whatever, they're not speaking for me. I've already been abandoned, just like the people in 48 had been abandoned. And I think this, the, movement, the movement here is very different around BDS, around student organizing, right? And, and them going after them in our campuses with this stupid law, right? And an artist too. And cultural institutions like the gallery, Sally, who's a curator here, took risks in having this conversation, right? That shouldn't be the case because of these kind of relations that we build together and the kind of knowledges that we end up sharing. And I think that's the point that I think, you know, this conversation is really anchored in. It's the theory, but it's also the practice and the possibilities that can emerge in our campuses, in our streets. Go ahead, Corey. Sorry. All good. Okay. Yeah. So much, uh, so many good things have been said. Um, just to respond, I worked for Oxfam in, in Palestine, so I'm, I could have a whole other conversation about about the you know development nonprofit industrial complex and um, especially you know I mean there are differences, but uh, anyway, I, I, I echo what what I mean just said. I, I wanted to respond to a number of things. Um, going back to Andrew's original question around Jewish indigeneity and Mark's response, I think, um, so I agree, I mean, that the indigeneity aspect was a lot, is a lot of how sort of the Zionist national narrative how, uh, was constructed, uh, but was not the main crux of it. Um, I, I would say, I mean, I wouldn't dismiss intentions, however, of, of those who are behind all of this. Um, I, I think I see what, you're, what you were saying, Mark, but... Um, you know, I think this links in many ways to, to the conversation and, and, and the results of all this mimicry, as, as Amin was, was talking about, you know, the, the Zionist movement came about um, as a result of, of, of thinking about how to resolve the Jewish question. And, and there was in, in Europe and, you know, the subjugation and, and oppression of Jews in Europe. And there were many different opinions on that, right? And between, you know, before the Holocaust, the biggest organization of Jews in Europe was the Bund, which had a very different perspective on uh, Jewish uh, self-determination, which was anti-Zionist and, and, and had, you know, called for, um, you know, autonomy for, for Jewish communities in Europe. The Zionists, uh, as, as Daniel Boyeran has written, um, you know, adopted this sort of colonial mimicry, right? This was the only way they were convinced to be accepted as as, 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 you know, in humanity, right? This is the way that they, they could be accepted by, as white, essentially, right? As being, you know, as themselves engaging in this colonial project that's linked and, in, 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 you know, supported by Europe, right? So, you know, and in thinking about what, what Erica was saying too, about like what, like the hoops that you have to jump to, through, the ways in which, you know, um, oppressed groups or, or colonized groups have to, um, speak the word of, words of the colonizer, or, or you know, behave like 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 the like you know white people or the colonizer. Um, so like, how do we you know how do we end this cycle of mimicry, <laughs> right? Of colonial mimicry, of white mimicry, right? How do we create different frames and 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 uh, uh, you know break break from that cycle, right? Um, the Jewish problem, the Palestinian problem, you know, and then of course. Uh, you know, Palestinians having, you know, the PA and, and subjugation of other Palestinians. Um, and, you know, I think w when you were talking about the sort of specificity of the, of Israel as a settler colony, 
Um, I don't know that many, I'm interested in maybe another time to hear from Mark about different examples, but one, one that popped in my mind was Liberia and, and the, um, you know, it's not an area of expertise, but you know, the, of, of mine, but you know, the whole back to Africa movement uh, and the way in which, you know, some uh, ex-slaves in, uh, black slaves in, in the US went to Liberia and, you know, ended up subjugating the local African population, uh, right? And, and, and of course that was on the pretext of being indigenous uh, to Africa which is true, I mean, yeah. So, you know, I think there are a few of those examples which are interesting um, to, to explore. And, um, and yeah, I, I was also just thinking about, you know, inserting into the conversation, the question around self-determination and what that means. Uh, that's something that's included in one of the examples of, um, of the IRA definitions, to bring it back to that. Um, denying Jews the right to self-determination, for example, um, suggesting that, uh, Israel is a racist endeavor. The, the establishment of Israel is a racist endeavor, right? Um, so this question around self-determination, it's like, okay, what, is that, what does that mean though, right? Um, you know, if we have this right to self-determination, I mean, does that, what, what is that, you know, that shouldn't mean, and I don't think it does mean the right to have a state at the, you know, an exclusive state or a state that, that you know, um, gives one rights or privileges over another group, especially in a, in a colonial situation. Um, and I think we need to do a lot, you know, a lot more to unpack that and, and perhaps to, you know, Peter Baynard actually had a really good article about, about that in Jewish Currents recently. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that's a conversation that we need to challenge. And also this, this idea that, you know, suggesting that Israel is a racist endeavor is racist it's anti-Semitic. I mean, it's backwards. I mean, it's it's anti-anti-racist. Therefore, is a, essentially racist. Um, so, you know, I think um, Mark has a lot of thoughts on this too. We've we've discussed this before, and and um, you know, I think it speaks also to just this general backlash against you know this work that we're that we're doing, whether it's about Palestine uh, or um, just like wokeness in general, and uh, you know, free speech. You know, when it protects the the far right um anyways I'll, I'll leave it at that for now may I, may I quickly just jump in after that? is that okay sure 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 uh, so just to clarify Corey uh when I was talking about intentions I wasn't talking about the goals of Zionism and the Zionist movement but the intentions of specific individuals specific families oh, I came here because you know, uh, the pogroms or, or, or whatever, the, just like settlers would come here, I came here because of the famine, et cetera, et cetera. So I was just this, uh, separating those two intentions out. Um, and, and in fact, though, I don't, I, I'm separating them for the sake of understanding the larger political project, but it doesn't mean that they're insignificant for analysis, because in some of them, you will find the excess to and the opposition to that political project that would use those those peoples, the, those bodies, those movements, those actions in specific directions, sometimes despite their uh, despite their 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 intentions, um, uh, and and so you know ultimately the Jewish question in Europe is now intertwined with the Palestinian question, and in, and in my view that those they, those can't be unintertwined, uh, and neither should they be, uh, and at this point, I mean it's it's. It's th th there's there's nothing fair about about bringing that the, the horrors of of, of anti-Semitic Europe's on the Palestinians, but that's what has happened, and now Palestinians are part of that story. Um, uh, but th but to tie it into your last point, that is precisely what the IHRA and other definitions of anti-Semitism, like the Jerusalem Declaration, uh, which opposes the IHRA, but not nearly strong enough, as far as I'm concerned, in a, a very problematic way, is in is that it excludes the Palestinian experience from that story now of the Jewish question. Um, whether you like it or not, the Jewish question of Europe is now a Palestinian question as well. Done. Um, and, and we can't be excluded from any conversation that wants to bring us into its documents, whether the IHRA or the Jerusalem Declaration. Um, and of course, the Jerusalem, the, the IHRA is 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 a is a serious threat. I've worked with Corey. I'm, I'm still working with Corey. We'll continue to work with Corey and Independent Jewish Voices and others uh, uh, to oppose uh, its adoption in Canadian universities and Canadian institutions. And that is a a fight that we 
I hope many of you will 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 support and 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 ask your you know respective faculty associations at Guelph if anybody here from Guelph is listening uh, uh, to to oppose the adoption of the IHRA, which is a way to tell Palestinians what it is that they can and cannot say about their own dispossession, their own oppression, and the structural violences that they face. And, and let me just use a, a very quick quote from Edward Said from, from 1979. And, and, and because the way in which this whole discourse has been established is that um, uh, Palestinians who oppose, uh, uh, the, I'm not talking just opposing Netanyahu, opposing the foundation of Israel, uh, 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 they are they are posed as anti-Semitic as doing that because they hate Jews. Um, uh, and Edward Said wrote in 1979, Palestinian resistance was never launched, and I quote, because the Palestinian natives thought that Jews were evil, but because no natives take kindly to having their territory settled by foreigners. End quote. I don't think anything else needs to be said, honestly, in response to this accusation. I, I think these accusations of Palestinians being anti-Semitic because they are opposed to uh, Israeli uh, uh, dispossession of Palestinians is absolutely ludicrous uh, and outrageous. And it's only in specific uh, um, uh, settler colonial context in which we all are all thinking and writing here today and Euro-American settler colonial context that this becomes somehow a valid argument and we become the radicals for trying to oppose it. Um, um, and, and it's, it reminds me of, of, and I'll end it here because, because others will have more to say about this, but, um, it reminds me of, of a talk that I attended at MRU a few years ago, um, around indigenous struggles and, and an elder, um, and there was a discussion about how, uh, you know, views of calling Canada a settler colonial state was considered a radical position. Um, and, and an elder got up and, and just said, What's so radical about the truth? <laughs> I don't think anything else needs to be said but that. <laughs> Thank you. Andrew, go ahead. Yeah. Can I, however, say something else? Uh, I mean, not directly about what you said, Mark, but about the, the IRA definition and the, and the Jerusalem Declaration. And I, I, for those who haven't read the IGJB, uh, definition uh, it's it's worth looking at it's much shorter and and Israel is is relegated to a, a very <laughs> short rejoinder at the very end of it it's not Israel centric which is a uh, very much appreciated uh, and it, it probably I think of of the three is the, the best that I've certainly seen so far but there may be others now other organizations who are going to come forward with their own definitions maybe JVP will do that it's become a frontline issue, and uh, and and I want to say something provocative about that. Uh, it's important. Uh, it has consequences. It's a speech right issue, uh, which you know for all of us and for our students and our peers is is very important because we're all you know we're all speakers and writers and cultural workers and, but it's also a distraction, um, and. Uh, and in, in tandem with a lot of lawfare, Zionist lawfare, it ties us up in these interminable conversations and a lot of action and energy goes towards combating this or that, this or that placement of language and so on and so forth. Our students are up in arms about it, rightly so. Students care about speech rights almost more than anything else. <laughs> Try and suppress their speech rights. They get fired up. But look at what's going on on the ground. More and more land is being expropriated as we speak. 12,000 homes in the settlements were green-lighted last year. Another 800 were green-lighted the day before Trump left office. If we, put it, if we put it in that context, that a lot of the arguments and the controversies and the debates that have been generated by Israeli authorities and pro-Israeli advocates are intended to be a distraction. And again, I want to be clear, I'm not discounting the importance of the, of the work that should go into combating that, that definition. Uh, it is important, but let's not you know, lose sight of what's happening on the ground 
and to the land even as we speak which is why you know we're having this this conversation in in the lead up to land day thank you andrew i mean i think that you know one of the things that comes to mind and then i want to pass it on to erica and then uh, chandani and and others uh for more, one more round because the the people who are watching are interested and, and there there's no questions we're fielding them as we go but if anything comes up we'll share I agree 100% that, you know, often in order to win, we have to have our own strategy and not react. That's like broad principles, right? And I think the challenges our movements are facing right now are around world making in a very detailed way. Again, not to take away at all from these fights, because as an educator, I know that my students would choose not to write about Palestine <laughs> Um, just because it's not a thing that gives you a job, right? And that if it's not, if, if you're not the people that are writing about it, after a while, you don't know what to read about it. And then the epistemology, like knowledges get created and, and you have to figure out how to find other knowledges, right? So then that's the thing. So I think that's one point. The second point is that in thinking about our movements, when we're talking about solidarity, in a way, the challenge for us is how to think of solidarity as like these things which we've articulated in relation, how do they relate to this law that is problematic, but how does it relate to the institution that we're having this conversation at? Because one of the things that I think is very important about building uh, and imagining is for things to be both concrete right? Because it's a way to move and our relationships are clear. We're on Zoom. We can see each other. And then we have specificities of our struggle coming together to try to figure it out a little bit, right? And have these kind of conversations. So I think about, I think about the idea of <clears throat> these identities that are mentioning because we're born into them and there are many, right? And one of them is like Palestinian. And there's another one that's like indigenous. And then there's a specificity that are related to that. And I think about these things and I think about people are there, at least the people we're working with, they're there. But the issue becomes in terms of the demands or the imagination, the political imaginary. How do we exist as settler, you know, settlers that reject settling <laughs> with people that are, you know, that are migrants, forced migration? What does it mean to be for land back? without any conditions or qualifications, but for, to be for black liberation without any conditions or qualifications. That's the kind of work that we're facing on the ground because it's easy to go out in a protest for black life, you know, and then a protest for Palestine. But what are we building analytically and imaginatively beyond making the case for each or against or, or for each other? And I think that this law, in a way, just as an exercise, offers that possibility right now, just in these few minutes that we have remained, to riff. Why is this law important for all of us here? Right? Just like, why does it matter about what, what matters about this law? What can the gallery do differently? What can we do differently? right? Not to make it the sole thing about it, because at the end of the day, I was in Germany, people are, are saying shit, we say what we mean, because we're, we're down for the struggle. And the struggle has never been without cost, right? But that's a culture that needs to be developed. And I think that this law is trying to stifle the culture that we have been successful in developing right now. So maybe that's a prompt for Erica, and let's go one one more wave through. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that brought up um, a very important point that I sort of wanted to end on, which is um, so much of what I've learned from studying um, Black scholars and Black community organizers in the past few years. I'm still completely new to all of the theory and don't claim to know much about it, but um, it's been such a guiding force in my life that I wanna bring it up. Um, I mean, you brought up the idea of how our dreams of liberation are literally made impossible, in, especially in certain spaces. 
Um, and I was thinking about Ronaldo again, Corey, it's funny that um, he taught you because he was one of my supervisors. Um, and um, I remember having this same discussion um, about how on, in places like the hood or the res reserve or reservation or Palestine or border zones, um, our, all of our ideas of liberation are, are meant to be impossible, like they're designed to be impossible. And so to even um, be able to dream beyond the, the state, um, beyond the university, beyond museums or beyond um, whatever colonial structures we're facing and, and are interfering in our lives, um, is something truly remarkable. And you also said the struggle has never been without cost. And I think of that, I was reading one of Mark's uh, pieces that he just recently published. Um, and he talks about in interacting with um, some folks who came over to Palestine when he was younger and sort of the interesting nature of that interaction and like um, wondering why these folks basically chose to put themselves in the position of being in solidarity with Palestine, of of being putting themselves in in harm's way, basically. And what resonated with me about that is that um, so often I get asked the question as like an ind indigenous organizer, um, what drives you forward and like what keeps you going? And the reality is that we have no other choice. <laughs> like it's not a, it's not something that I do for fun. It's not something that, um, like I think often what would I be doing uh, with my life if I didn't have to be um, discussing uh, and responding to anti-Indigenous racism um, every day of my life in the prairies in Canada. Um, so yeah, dreaming is such an important part of that, um, moving beyond that. And I wanted to say thank you to Chadney for bringing up uh, the Wet'suwet'en struggle because we actually had a, um, an inner city blockade here as well. And it was right before the pandemic started. And it was such an amazing experience to just um, see the amount of folks who were coming out and um, in my experience as well on having been on certain like indigenous and Palestinian solidarity panels um, and seeing what students are facing in these institutions, um, like the lack of funding, these, these panels are not funded, right, by the university, of course not. Um, but being in that space and seeing how deep Palestinian solidarity goes with um, indigenous solidarity on this land. Um, and remembering the first time I read Mahmoud Darwish and uh, getting to meet Mark for the first time, all of those things give me, give me um, ways to dream. So yeah, I'll just leave it there. Thank you, Erica. Um, so actually it's really interesting, Erica, that you um, bring that, that you know, you end with that point because I remember we brought you to U of T uh, as part of having you reflect on your relationship with Darwish as a writer, um, precisely in, in terms of, you know, continuing to build relations. And so I, I think it's incredible that you bring that up and part of you bringing that up and it being also at the university campus brings me to the point on IHRA, right? And the challenges that student organizers, faculty organizers, faculty, um, anybody doing any sort of work that is critical of Israel, right? Or Israel is a racist endeavor as <laughs> has been um, outlined in that, in that IHRA document so problematically uh, is, is facing in, in the most uh, uh, horrific kinds of ways. And I think that when I think about that definition, and then I also look at the Jerusalem Declaration, one of the problems with all of this is that they forgot about settler colonialism. This is the problem because they don't understand 
the actual context and state formation history. So yes, there's a lot around the history of Zionism that it's considered or the history of, um, well, Zionism pulled out of the settler colonial reality or, um, or a lot around anti-Semitism straight going back to the Holocaust, right? Or to Nazi um, violence. But what is completely erased is the settler colonial reality and this relation of colonizer and colonized. And so what I find so deeply problematic is then the these all of it. I mean, on the one hand, absolutely, like the Jerusalem Declaration will be strategically used, right? Because of who it's crafted by. And so I'm not dismissing it. I think it's important that we have that document now. But I also think that precisely to Mark's earlier point is that Palestinian, once again, the Palestinian voice and the Palestinian ontology and epistemology yet again is, is back to where it's supposed to belong. And so that is really deeply troubling for me in terms of uh, what that means. And I can say so much more on the IHRA, but I don't want to. What I what I do want to say is that the lawfare piece is, is and, and the IHRA has created serious challenges for solidarity, even amongst progressives, because what is going on that I can I can share just like really truthfully is that people are really scared. People are scared about having to, you know, have to go to court because if you're in solidarity, your student group or you're a grassroots organization, you're learning about Palestine, in principle, you're in solidarity, you want to do work, and then you're met with this like backlash in the most horrific ways where you don't have the language or the political strategy, and you're not necessarily part of the BDS movement. You work with organizers, right? But that's not your work. Your work is maybe abolition or police brutality or indigenous land, you know, claims or whatever. And so what I'm noticing is actually that even progressives who want to be in solidarity in principal ways, who are making the connections, at moments are getting scared of the implications this has for their work. And certainly I know the student unions that have, you know, passed these motions and have adopted divestment um, campaigns. They're also going through that. I'm a part of UTFA. I mean, it's a shit show, like the, the amount of fighting that is going on. So what has also happened with this IHRA is it's created so much confusion amongst folks. For others, it's created a lot of fear. It's And then lawfare is creating a lot of fear around like, oh my God, in order for us to say anything about Palestine, we need to have lawyers and we need to have a lot of money and resources. So what does that mean? And I think that IJB is doing incredible work to back folks up, to support folks. I think ARC, right, which Mark can speak to later, is doing incredible work and knowing that, and then Faculty of Palestine is doing incredible work um, to fight the IHRA. So these three bodies in the context of, I think the Canadian context, who are fighting hard and, and are providing resources and support for people who are under attack right now is, is also incredible. I know that after I give, gave a lecture on Ghassan Kanafani, um, I haven't made it public, but they came down on me really hard um, as a way to use an example at U of T to say, here's another example of anti-Semitism. This is why we need the IHRA. And it could have meant as a non-tenure track faculty member to, you know, potentially have my employment rescinded. So the fear also of like junior faculty stepping up or people worried that this could lead to them ca being called anti-Semitic um, or, or losing material like, you know, things. And because I'm trained very well, um, this stuff doesn't, you know, it, it's a day that you feel pissed and you take off from, you know, the world, but you come back fighting it because, you know, there, there, there is no other option as, as, um, as, uh, as has been said by Erica and others that, you know, we have to survive, whether that's IHRA or that's, you know, stuff on, on the land or um, aggression in whatever form it comes in, we have to survive. So all the resistance that we do is part of part of that survival. And you can get tired and take breaks, but um, you, you can't stop because there's no choice. And I think I want to end with the piece on imagination, since we're also trying to not be nihilistic and be hopeful, is that this idea of a poetics of relation is something that is from a Caribbean writer, Eduardo Guilesant, that I've always found so helpful to think about relations to other people, to land, to life, uh, to struggles. Um, and I think it's in the struggle that we can continue to keep each other um, excited about the possibilities of radical imaginings and you know, possibilities for freedom. 
because it's in struggle that we find answers to everything I find. If I did this work academically alone, I couldn't. If I did it in an activist silo, I couldn't. But I think when we really struggle, when we work together, when we organize, when we think intellectually, when we you know, think of strategies, take history, all of this, in struggle, we're, we're able to arrive um, somewhere. So I am really um, hopeful about, um, Yes, the situations are shitty, but I'm hopeful about the people's possibilities and what we can do together and with all the collectives that we know and the global movements that we're part of um, to continue to fight this because we have been. And yeah, and that's, that's I guess, all the poetics of relation. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, uh... First of all, I don't know what I would do without Darwish, so uh, thank you for bringing him up. Um, uh, so as uh, Chandi mentioned, I am a member of the uh, Academic Alliance Against Anti-Semitism, Racism, uh, Colonialism, and Censorship in Canada, for short, ARC. We didn't do a good job coming up with a, <laughs> a quick name, uh, but I've added the link to our uh, campaign uh, uh, to the panelists here. I'm not sure if it can be shared with the others as well. Uh, listening in. Um, so you'll find much more information about that there. Um, and and uh, our goal is simple, is to get faculty associations across the country to uh, pass motions that, that, that clearly state that they oppose the adoption of the IHRA. Um, and, and as I said before, you know, uh, only a couple of quotes are needed to oppose its substance. There's not much substance there to begin with. Um, um, I've written an op-ed in Al Jazeera on it addressing the, the substance a little bit more. So let me just talk a little bit about its structure uh, uh, here to end. Um, the IHRA is, is a typical state-centric document. It has no connection to grassroots. It has um, a, a, a sort of a, a very little concern for uh, a, a, the interests of, of, of varying groups within society. Like any other state-centric document and project, it is driven to address state-centric elite interests. Um, and and that, that's how the document was produced. It was produced through state structures, not through a really like a consultation. I mean, consultation after you've written it is not consultation. Also a critique I have of the uh, Jerusalem Declaration. Um, um, there was no any real consultation with the Palestinians. Uh, um, uh, but uh, anyway, it is different than, than the IHRA in these regards, in these structures. Um, so it, 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 it is, it, it's a top-down, you know, that's what we call in sociology, top-down process. It's, it's, your, it's your classic uh, uh, ideal type of, of top-down processes. Um, and and it's it operates that way. So um, it, it is meant to um, you know speak to EDI people who are corporate EDI people, um, EDI people that work for the Liberal government and advise Trudeau um, and even the NDP establishment. They're not talking to EDI people working with faculty associations, EDI people who have made uh, uh, um, dedicated their entire lives to developing properly anti-racist praxis, properly anti-colonial praxis. Um, that, that's the difference between people who oppose the IHRA and people who are proponents of it. The people who are proponents of it are your corporate EDI types. Uh, the people who are its opponents are people like independent Jewish voices, scholars, activists, people on the ground that understand that this is an effort to purely um, um, uh, silence and marginalize um, all voices, whether they come from Palestinians or other people uh, who, who are seriously critical of Israel and Israeli state practices, policies, structures, and so on. Um, and, and it serves no other purpose but that. It has nothing to do with the necessary fight against the horror that is anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism, let me be clear, is at the foundation of the Euro-American nation state. Um, it is not something that is gone or ended after uh, the Holocaust. None of these Euro-American nation states have ever had a real reckoning with their anti-Semitism, which is rooted at their foundation. And ITRA does nothing to oppose that. The Jerusalem Declaration does reach into that a little bit better, which is why I'm, I'm not advancing arguments against it in the same way that I would advance against the IHRA. 
but it fails miserably, I think, and dangerously so in how it, um, um, uh, it marginalizes Palestinian voices and can be used as a tool by the people who are proponents of the IHRA to do the exact same work that the IHRA is meant to do. That's, that's my other huge criticism of the Jerusalem Declaration. People who are proponents of the IHRA can use this document as well to silence Palestinians. It will be, the, the onus will be on Palestinians to go to one set of guidelines to say, no, 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 you can't put me in that guideline, you gotta put me in that guideline. What, what, what's that gonna help? Um, um, so, um, you know, it, it's highly problematic in that regard. And, and, and you see, you know, the Palestinians appear in the Jerusalem Declaration in two ways. First, as emotional and feelings, that's it, right? Palestinians have emotions and feelings sometimes against Israel that we have to take seriously. That's in the preamble. Um, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm skipping past the fancy ways that they're writing it, but that's what they're saying. Um, and at the end, the last set of guidelines, again, I'll skip past the fancy stuff and get to it. Um, it has a subtitle that says, we don't necessarily agree with these actions. That part does not appear in anything else. So that heading says, all these Palestinian actions, they have the right to do BDS, but man, is it controversial and keep away from that. That's, that's the sub message of that. Whether it was intended or not uh, is irrelevant to me. That's the effects of the discourse. In this case, yes, intentions are irrelevant. <laughs> I will stick to that. The effects of the discourse are, are gonna matter more. But at any rate, um, uh, uh, the archery remains, I think, the top priority right now to, to oppose. So I, I would like to bring the attention back to that and, and just say that the idea that the IHRA is an anti-racist project is laughable. Um, and, 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 and please remind people of that when you hear that argument, because that's one of the counter arguments uh, that we hear. And, and I think Corey will do a pretty good job of, of, of talking about some of the other counter arguments better than I can, because he's faced them all <laughs> um, um, and has been arguing against them. So I, I will end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Mm. Um, sorry, you, you, Corey, and then I'll wrap up and hand it over to Sally. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, I want to say, um, yeah, um, I mean, it reminded us of this, but props to the Guelph Art Gallery and, and to all of you actually for, for, for daring to, to have this conversation, um, because yeah, I mean, it, it can be dangerous, um, and people lose their jobs and people don't get hired and people are, are, are slandered and, 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 and all of that. Right. So like, yeah, um, uh, much respect. It's, it's, it's quite easy for me. I mean, you know, there's certain risks as a Jewish person in terms of my community, et cetera, but, um, but it's relatively easy with my sort of, you know, with my white privilege and being Jewish to have these conversations. Um, so, so respect to everyone that's engaging in this. Uh, one thing we're actually doing um, is a research project right now, uh, collecting testimonies of those who have been impacted uh, by the IRA definition, but also, you know, by the weaponization of anti-Semitism uh, in general, to to really show, you know, how this is having an impact, um, and actually, Palestine Legal just put out an amazing new resource that does something similar, um, and and really traces the history around this. It's it's called well, the, the hashtag is distorted definition. We have another hashtag around this around this work, uh, which is really really great. Um, I wanted to. Yeah, I definitely encourage, and this is going back to I think what Andrew was saying uh, around the um, make, making sure we check our balance between the offensive and the defensive, um, making sure that we don't all get cut up in this IRA stuff, um, you know, and that we continue on the BDS front, we continue uh, to advance, you know, arguments uh, how Israel is an, an apartheid state. Um, you know, all of that is crucial. And so it would be, you know, um, a, a total victory for the, you know, for Israel um, and for, for pro-Israel lobby groups if we were all just distracted by this IHRA uh, bullshit, really. Um, on the other hand, I mean, one thing we've been trying to do is, you know, we've sort of recognized that, like, this is an important thing for us to work on as uh, Jews in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Um, so, you know, we are we're putting attention on that, but at the same time, we're trying to figure out ways to go on the offensive um, with it, right? Like, for example, you know, they're talking about 
you know, apartheid, saying apartheid is, is anti-Semitism and Israel's racist is, is anti-Semitism. So, you know, one of, the, one of the resources we have on our website is, um, is 11 examples of how Israel is actually a racist endeavor, right? Um, you know, and, and so we can, you know, we can use this to, to advance and, you know, maybe people are questioning. It was like when they, you know, they banned Kwaya from uh, the careers against Israeli apartheid from the Pride Parade in, in Toronto. Like, I think we had, you know, a lot of sort of middle of the road people asking like, why, right? I mean, so we, I think we need to use those opportunities to, you know, where discourse is, they attempt to ban discourse uh, to try to um, insert question marks in, into people's minds and to, and to try to advance our, um, our causes. And, and, you know, it doesn't have to be clear cut, uh, basically is what I'm saying. Uh, around the definitions question, it, it's tough. And, you know, we debated whether or not we, we buy into this definitions game. Um, you know, th they say that the IRA definition is the most widely accepted blah, blah, blah definition in the world. Um, but, you know, they were really the first ones to really engage in this political, this politicization of oppression definitions. And, and I, I might be wrong, I don't have the whole history, but as far as, you know, I know, they've, they're, they're really the first ones to really mobilize around definition. And so it's not surprising that you haven't had other states that have signed off on other definitions, for example, right? Um, so, you know, I think that's important to keep in mind. And it's the same with the Jerusalem Declaration, I think. You know, I think um, there are a lot of really good people that have that have signed on, and I think for that, I think they tried um, to accomplish two objectives. Right, one was to um, you know define anti-Semitism in a in a better, more appropriate way, and the other was to uh, critique and respond to the IRA definition. And in some ways, those objectives are contradictory, and end you know end up meaning that they fall into some of the traps of the IRA definition. I think also in certain terms of some language, strategically, I, I have a sense that they tried to appeal to some more mainstream audiences uh, and therefore, you know, gave into a few, uh, of, of, you know, problematic arguments and, and that, that was all included. So I'm, I'm hoping, I mean, yeah, we'll see how it plays out, uh, but I'm hoping for, the, you know, that it, it will be beneficial um, and that the, the problems with it, well, you know, I, I think it's really important. I think, you know, a lot of Palestinians have really um, introduced some very challenging and, and, and important critiques. I think the BNC critique, the BDS movement critique is really crucial to read. And I'm sure we're gonna see more and more of that. Um, and, you know, one thing that we're also working on with, with Jewish Voice for Peace is uh, putting out sort of guidelines on how to actually fight anti-Semitism. Uh, including doing so intersectionally um, and not isolating it and not put, essentializing Jews as the only ones that really need a definition to define their oppression, you know. Um, so watch for that sometime soon. Uh, just going back and to maybe conclude around the, the order and council in, in, um, in Ontario. So first of all, it, so it's, it's, a it's sort of a law, you know. Um, it's, it's, it's really sort of mysterious to many people. Um, it was intended to be a law in the first place, Bill 168. Uh, we mobilized around it quite, you know, and, and, and it caught on. Um, and, you know, we ended up, you know, we, we actually claimed it as a partial victory um, because they didn't proceed with the actual law. They ended up passing it actually the day or a few days before it was supposed to go to committee. And you had like over 100 people lining up to speak out against it. Um, they ended up passing it sort of by decree um, as an order in council, which is not a, a legislative mechanism that's used for such things in general. Um, and, uh, you know, it also didn't include reference to the examples, though they can be implied. In any case, it's a, it's a bit more murky than it would have been if passed by law, um, but it's still a threat. And, and, you know, I think one piece of evidence so far that we've seen it, it being where we've seen it being used is there was um, a video of a Palestinian student, high school student, taken down, um, the, the minister of education ordered to take down. It was a three minute video in which the, this student talked about the Palestinian struggle. And instead of saying the Israeli government, he said the Zionists, right? Um, and, you know, when we first saw the video, we're like, 
there's nothing wrong with this video. What's, what's the problem? The minister has been saying that this video, you know, supports anti-Semitic conspiracies, conspiracy theories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and the school boards bought into that and took it down and sent out the IRA definition to teach the public how to understand why this is anti-Semitic without actually saying why. Um, but as it turns out, the reason was because he said the Zionists. Um, and before the order in council was passed, they only talked about it as anti-Israel or biased. After the order in council, they talked about it as anti-Semitic. Um, so it sort of opened that door for the government to engage in that conversation. Um, which is super dangerous. And um, of course, there's also the, this campaign against Facebook declaring Zionist as, as a stand-in for Jew and therefore anti-Semitic, uh, which we're part of. So anyways, we have to, I think the response is to continue to, um, to violate the, the IRA definition. I mean, not the real <laughs> examples of anti-Semitism, but um, you know, especially when it comes to talking about settler colonialism, um, you know, making these connections, all of that, just like, you know, not give in to that and to, to fight it. And again, try not to get caught up too much in the defensive and, and see, and find opportunities to you to go on the offensive as well. Um, and to really uh, work towards um, this world that we want to live in. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. So in the spirit of both wrapping up and, and kind of continuing the conversation, which there'll be another one in two weeks. One of the things that I think in our organizing we're seeing is like, how do we de-exceptionalize these settler colonial institutions and making them sites of struggle in which the definition of a positive definition could be tacked on to other, both grievances and imaginaries. And I think that we've done this in the work, um, you know, where we say BDS is the floor, not the ceiling where we've applied a diversity of tactics and strategies, where we've taken issue with museums, including now the MoMA fight, uh, Strike MoMA, where you can read about it, where we're just like, museum is fine, but the museum is a settler colonial institution and it hides a bunch of people that are of a certain class that puts a, puts a certain ideology. <laughs> so there's a bunch of Zionists at MoMA, for example, who have a lot of wealth and who are dictating aesthetics and dictating programming and dictating education and dictating who gets represented, right, on stolen land in these kind of infrastructures. I say all this to add that, you know, for students that are afraid, what are the relationships that can be developed between adjunct and tenured and, and students across student bodies and communities around the institutions in which those walls can be both breached and made porous? to allow for a different people power to impact this conversation in addition to law, in addition to lobbying, in addition to the intellectual work that's happening so that you can both deal with things kind of vertically but also build horizontally and we don't have to choose offense and defense but have that be in the world making of the visionary organizing that Grace Lee Boggs would talk about. So thank you all so, 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 so much. And it's an honor, Erica, Chandini, Mark, and Corey. And uh, yeah, uh, in two weeks, we'll be doing this again. And this will be online for people. Um, so that's great to share. Thank you all. Uh, Sally, to you. Yes, so just to echo Amin's remarks, I just want to extend um, on behalf of the Art Gallery of Guelph and myself, I would like to thank all of you who participated today, Erica, Chadney, Mark, and Corey, as well as to those who were listening to the talk. I wanna thank everyone for their thankfulness um, for this very deeply nuanced and complex um, and complicated conversation. Um, as Amin, uh, mentioned our next uh, conversation will take place on Saturday, April the 12th, or sorry, 10th at noon. Um, so please continue to follow both uh, the events section on the Art Gallery of Guelph's website and the Decolonize This Place website and their Instagram for further updates and information. Um, a happy weekend to everyone. Bye-bye.